I think I'm, I'm seeing a lot more people who are catching on to the aggressive elk calling mm-hmm. hunting style, and it's exciting because it's that style of hunting is just exciting. But it's also rewarding. It's tough, but it's rewarding. Why not? So I did mountain goat and moose. Have you ever done hunted those? They don't bugle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, born and raised, we'd talked with them forever. I've been good friends with Cody and Trent and, and their crew for several years. And every year we talk, we need to do a hunt together. We need to do a hunt together. And it finally worked out this year. So so give me some dirt. You know, like what's it like to hunt with Trent and Cody? And Cody's as great as they come. Trent, I, you know, I'm still, <laughs> the, the jury's out on Trent. It's persistence. If we have a drop of blood, that prolongs our tracking for at least another two hours. And so there was enough blood, though, that you were able to follow it for two miles. Yeah. And, and I'm talking a drop of blood every hundred yards. Enough blood. Uh, all right, folks. Welcome to the Gritty Bowman Podcast. We're at the Western Hunt Expo in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I'm here with Corey Jacobson, uh, my guest today. Uh, Elk 101. Uh, basically, what is it? Nine time? Eight time? <laughs> World champion elk caller. Oh, I thought you meant eight or nine time on your podcast. <laughs> there is that. Um, you did. Uh, did you? Did you win this year? I did not. I got <laughs> second place last year. Yeah, I and, hate to bring uh, that up. No, it's it's actually really good because that's what drives me is competition. You know, yeah, I, I hate winning because when I win going into it the next year, I'm not nearly as motivated. <laughs> and it's, it's weird, but yeah, when you get second place by one or two <laughs> points, it gets the fire back, the competition back in it. So it's, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Month away. So, you know, I can't have you on the podcast without talking to you about elk hunting. <laughs> so, or elk calling. That works good because <clears throat> I can't talk about anything other than elk hunting. So. And, you know, Corey, you seem to be able to, get it done every single year you know in the elk woods and everybody um everybody tries you know that's the goal but you seem to make it happen and we were just talking about this before we fired the mics up and like how do you do it you know i don't know i I mean yes i do know but at the end of the day it's just it's a it's a drive it really is and you and I were talking about it, you know, just you see elk five miles away, 5,000 feet above you, you just have to go. There's no second guessing, no saying, well, it's a long ways, maybe they'll come down. You just, you go, and, and honestly, that's what we do. We just, we go. We we find elk. We push ourselves as hard as we can to find the elk, and then once we find them, we push ourselves and are aggressive to hunt them. And, you know, it's, uh, I think I'm, I'm seeing a lot more people who are catching on to the aggressive elk calling mm-hmm. hunting style, and it's exciting because it's that style of hunting is just exciting. But it's also rewarding. It's tough, but it's rewarding. And, you know, for me, that's I love that reward of a successful elk hunt. It's it's kind of, <clears throat> it's when, when you're elk hunting, uh, this year I did moose, I did mountain goat, I did, um, some bear, um, I did rifle elk, I did, um, you know, archery elk, uh, uh, archery whitetail, um, uh, did whitetail twice this year and then, um, did mule deer in Alberta. <clears throat> Here's what I have to say. Did you do any working this year? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, they were short one day hunts. I mean, it, may, it makes yeah. it sound like it. Uh, so did these, these hunts and we're going to publish these, uh, hunts. I was telling you, uh, just day by day. We're going to launch that here in the next month or two. So it'll be cool to share all those hunts from last year and yeah. take people on the season. But what I was going to say is elk hunting is work yep. of all those hunts. If I were to, if you were to ask me, what is the most difficult? What's the hardest? Elk hunting is work. Yep. With a capital W, W O R K, work. It's just hard. W O R K. Did I say that? W O R K. Dude, that's because I <laughs> can't spell. <clears throat> I can't I've been spell a little it, under the weather. <clears throat> I'm going to blame it on uh, medications. Yeah. No, uh, it's work. It is. And and honestly, I think that. A lot of people shy away from work, but once you get the reward that comes from that hard work, 
that's what drives me. Just that, that overcoming the challenges and recognizing and realizing success. It's, there's a, I don't know, there's something addictive about elk hunting. Yeah. And obviously they bugle, they're beautiful animals, all of that, the country they live in. But yeah, just, I, I do not shy away from the hard part of elk hunting, which is day in, day out grind. I would say that right now, um, well, you tell me, you, you pretty much, elk hunting is the pinnacle, the, the epitome of what you do. Totally. Yeah. Why not, let's say, mule deer? Why not? So I did mountain goat and moose. Have you ever done a hunt of those? They don't bugle. <laughs> and so that's what I was going to ask. Like, Because here I am reflecting on my own season. And I love, I loved the mountain goat hunt. I mean, the country was totally. I'd love to hunt mountain goat. Phenomenal, and um, and the moose, the same thing. But when I look at everything I've ever experienced hunting, n- now more than ever, elk hunting is like winning. It's it's the hunt I'm the most passionate about. Totally. And it's the most accessible, probably, yeah, to me from a public land standpoint. To anybody, yeah, from an over the counter standpoint, from yep. an opportunity standpoint, Moose, from the potential sheep, standpoint. Mountain goat, all of those. Those are, I mean, they're out of reach for a lot of us. Yeah, we can get lucky and draw one living in Idaho, and it's once in a lifetime. Or you can save up and go on a you know hunt in BC or Alaska, something like that. Which is those are great opportunities. But when it comes to just hundreds of thousands of over-the-counter public land tags available why not hunt elk it's funny because you know what's coming in close second for me lately is whitetail yeah it's like they're the most accessible and yet i'm finding them to be the most uh the ones that get me the most excited how strange is that yeah because you'd think you know it's the rare and the hard to obtain right but it's not. Yeah. I think for elk, they're, it's just the majesty that they have. Yeah. The, the way they swagger, the bugle, you know, the attitudes, the yeah. rut. Well, we're across the booth from us here. There's a great big, big screen TV showing hunting films. And every time an elk comes on, I <laughs> tractor beam, just focus <laughs> in. And Brian has to nudge me and say, hey, we're <laughs> doing a podcast here. It's true. Like, so on that. Tell us a little bit about your elk hunting season from, from this past season. You know, we, you tell me, first of all, what elk hunts did you do? We, uh, we started in Wyoming with uh, Born and Raised in the Land of the Free Project and then came home and, and uh, as, as you know, I'm building a home in central Idaho and it's completed now, but during last hunting season it wasn't <laughs> and I thought I'd be a, a good husband and responsible and and uh, check in on progress anyway during elk <laughs> season. So we hunted close to home, just right, you know, literally stayed at the at the condo we were renting and hunted out of that. Uh, we didn't actually camp out a single night. We came <laughs> home every night. Uh, so, you know, we were within an hour's drive of, of home. And uh, then we did the hunt of a lifetime hunt uh, with uh, a boy with brain cancer from uh, <clears throat> back in Pennsylvania. Yeah. So that was my... So elk season, what was the highlight? Oh man, every day. <laughs> it's hard to pick a favorite day. Uh, you know, born and raised, we'd talked with them forever. I've been good friends with Cody and Trent and, and their crew for several years. And every year we talk, we need to do a hunt together. We need to do a hunt together. And it finally worked out this year. So, so give me some dirt, you know, like what's it like to hunt with? Trent and Cody and Cody's as great as they come. Trent, I, you know, I'm still, <laughs> the, the jury's out on Trent. <laughs> no, Trent, uh, first day. So, uh, first morning, Dirk and I went out together and, uh, Trent was hunting with Donnie <clears throat> and Donnie was calling. I was calling and then Dirk was shooter and Trent was shooter. And Dirk and I happened to have a great morning. Dirk shot his, you know, filled his bowl the first day and, uh, so the next day we had, we had a whole schedule planned out of who was hunting with who, who was caller, who was a shooter, yeah. just to make sure we rotated through everything. And next day Trent was calling for me and 
there Cody was filming and he's back you know he talked and it's complete banter the whole time just yeah. you know comedy show and I'm like guys we're here to hunt let's take it a little <laughs> bit serious or we aren't going to fill tags and right and uh, I think you can see in the order of who filled their tags who took it the most serious <laughs> Trent shot his on the last day <laughs> if that's any indication but uh, so we're hunting Trent's calling for me we're walking back we get these elk calling at like 11 o'clock in the morning they're bedded up on a north face and so we're circling back to get on the ridge and get the wind and get up above them and Cody's walking behind, and he's like, man, this is a dream come true, being able to hunt with Corey finally. You know, we're just, this is awesome. And and we get up there, and Trent's talking about how nervous he is to be calling for me. And I'm like, guys, we're just elk hunting. Let's, you know, let's, let's just have fun. Let's not talk about any of that. And he calls in a bull. And I'd already made up my mind, unless it was a solid six point, I wasn't going to shoot it. I was, uh-huh. you know, I just, I wanted that experience. I wanted to hunt. I wanted to not be over the first morning. And a bull steps out, comes running down the hill, Trent's calling, and he's a four by six. Goofy, I mean, just <laughs> yeah. weird genetics, young bull. And I passed him up at 18 yards. I came to full draw. Yeah. 18 yards broadside, he turns to 30. I cow call, he turns broadside again. <laughs> I'm still at full draw. I let down. He walks up to 45 yards. I draw again on him. And let down, and I mean, just a clear pass up. And I don't pass up very many elk. Yeah. And I'm just thinking, this is so awesome. Trent's back there calling. Cody's sitting right here next to me. This is this yeah. is a dream. This is this is awesome. And Trent comes back, and he's like, well, and he's 60 yards behind us, so he can't see anything. Yeah. And he's like, well, and uh, <laughs> Cody, I think it was Cody, it might have been me, said, passed him up. <laughs> now, there's some acting that goes on. When you're videoing a hunt, there, there's there's a little bit. Sometimes you create drama. Yeah. I really thought Trent was going to hit me with his bugle, too. <laughs> like, he looked at me and he said, you did what? And I said, you can see a little bit out of that on the YouTube it, video. It, it wasn't asking. He was mad. I, I literally, for the next 10 minutes, thought he may not talk to me the rest of the day. <laughs> like, I can't believe you passed it up. I called that bull into 18 yards for you. And he had six points on the side. Yeah. And you passed it up. I'm like, Trent, I'm having a blast. I don't want this to end first yeah. morning. This is a first <clears throat> hour that, that I've like, my bow all season. That sounds like the interaction Aaron and I have. Yeah. Where I pass on something and he's like, why? What? <laughs> what? Because if it breathes, yeah. it's brown, it's down yep. there. Yeah. And Trent was, just, I mean, he was just like, what, what was your point of passing that bull up? Like, what are you trying to prove? <clears throat> like, I'm not trying to prove anything. I just want to extend the hunt a little longer. And he's like. You can still go and hunt with us. Like, we can call, and you could have shot that elk, right? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, I don't understand. I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, is um, I don't think, for those guys, I don't think they've ever passed. Yeah. If it's whatever comes, comes, yep. and they, they take it. Yeah. So then I was labeled a trophy hunter after that. Oh, and- yeah. Let me explain. Let me share you my story, okay? I'm in Montana, and I just shot a bull in Colorado like six days earlier. Right? Great bull. I'm really happy. Public land, archery, worked my butt off, you know, made it happen, and it was great. We go to Montana, and Casey and Jordan have us hunting on a whitetail, on an alfalfa field <laughs> in, in a far, on a farm in a hay bale blind, <clears throat> like we're whitetail hunting. And there's 600 head of bull elk coming into this meadow, and there's, there's bulls and, and rutting that I've never seen in my life. And bulls making sounds that are, and this is private, you know, this is a whole, this is just like, this is just a fun romp after elk. But I'm looking around, I'm like, yeah, I have no interest in shooting the first bull elk, elk that, that walks in front of, your in front of me because yeah. it would be over. It would have been over almost every day if that had been, if, if I had been down with that. But, you know, um, Casey had. Casey, uh, Jordan hadn't shot a bull before with his bow. So, yeah, he shot the first bull that came by. Yeah. Aaron is Aaron, so he shot the first bull that came by, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't want to shoot the bull, the first bull that came out, because this is like day one, day two of yeah. this this hunt. and You've got meat in the freezer. You're, <clears throat> yeah. And I wanted to experience, well, these guys are back there, you know, at three, four, or 500 yards watching through their spotting scopes, live streaming it on Instagram and talking about how I'm the picky bowman because I won't, <laughs> I won't shoot a bull. Um, and they were, 
they were pretty hostile over it. Like, what are you trying to prove? I mean, what's your what's your deal? It was like out and out shaming yeah. because I I wanted to shoot an older class animal. Yep. And uh, and it really it it wasn't about um, trying to prove anything. I I want a certain experience, yep. and I I didn't care if I went home without an elk. I didn't care because I was loving the whole experience being in the blind and everything, yep. soaking it in. Totally. So, uh, how did you and Trent resolve this? Uh, I don't know. I, I might have shared some trail mix with him, and he <laughs> got over it. about it really quickly. <laughs> or, yeah, I don't know what happened. Uh, it was funny because <laughs> he stepped up, and they, I don't know, I, I watched, I think I watched all the episodes and didn't skip over anything. I don't remember seeing it, but he, uh, he stepped up on a ridge to bugle, and he'd step out there and bugle, and he turned out, that sound okay? You know, he's really, yeah. and it, a lot of it was just joking, banter back and forth, but. I got right behind him one time, and he stepped up to bugle. And so I stepped right behind him and just went through the motions behind him like I was bugling. He turned around and, you know, so it was just all day was, was a comedy show. And, uh, you know, he got over it. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was okay. And we all filled our tags. By the end of the week, we'd shot four elk, uh, public land, general tag. Uh, just it was, it was fun. Nice. We had to work. You know, it wasn't it wasn't easy. A couple of them came easy, uh, but Trent had to work for his. Really, and he had never shot a six point bull in his life. And I kept telling him, "You can't shoot a five point, okay? Not before ten o'clock in the morning. If if you want to shoot a five point, it has to be between ten o'clock and two o'clock." And just to hold him off the trigger. And of course, he didn't heed <laughs> that. You know, he he would have shot anything that came in. And so he kept telling him. I'm not sure if the law allows you to shoot. I don't remember if it's four points or five points. And just to be safe, we, let's hold off for a six point. And, uh, yeah, literally the last morning, we kind of went into scramble mode, went to a completely different part of the unit. Uh, we split up into two groups just to go and find elk. Mm-hmm. And Donnie and I happened to find some elk. And uh, we thought for sure they had got into them because we got into several bugles. We called in a bull right to the truck uh, after dark, came into 20 yards of the truck and walked down over the hill and i mean so we're we're thinking they probably shot one tonight Mm -hmm. and they came back so we didn't hear a bugle so next morning we went back into that area and uh called this bull in i think he came in three different times and just couldn't get a shot we're in a burn it's open couldn't move and so we just pushed forward and got up and got right on the same ridge he was on and uh, Dirk and Donnie stayed back calling, and I was right there over Trent's shoulder. And the bull, you could tell, as soon as we got up there and got in his grill, he turned and got aggressive and said, he's coming. And uh, Trent kept raising his bow up, raising his bow up to draw and putting it down, raising it up to draw. I'm like, don't draw, don't draw, wait, wait. Because, you know, the bull's out 120 yards, and once you get drawn, you're committed. You can't let down in that open stuff. Yeah. And he got to about 35 yards. I'm like, draw. And uh, he drew back, and the bull came to, I don't know, 15 yards in frontal. It looked like there was a burn, wide and, open, and there were yeah, uh, yeah so burn trees. How, how did he get the bow back at, when you got him just, within thirty? You know, and he goes. There's always opportunities to draw, unless you're in a wide open meadow. But anytime so there's, there was a few trees, yeah, there were the, burnt trees. There. So when he stepped behind, like his eyes were shielded, exactly. Or yep, he got the bow back. Yep, got the bow back, and bull didn't even, you know, wasn't alarmed now, at all. And now, how close are you to the bull right now, calling? Uh, like. Like So we were, the bull came in the first time, so we, we do a little thing we call the slingshot, where I get right up with, with either I'm the shooter or I'm with the shooter, uh-huh. doing the calling, get the bull to commit, and then Dirk's back 50 yards, 60 yards, and basically he's the closer, pulls the bull right into the lane, and the bull you know comes in, we're close enough to pressure him, the bull's coming into those calls mad, wanting to fight, and then as the call becomes 50, 60 yards away, he's not concerned about that, he's not even thinking, hey, what's going on, why is he doing this, I'm going to find him, I'm going to go and stomp him. And he just keeps coming. Yeah. So, As, so you're right there with the shooter, calling, yep. calling, calling, getting that bull worked up. And where he'd normally maybe hang up, yep. you're, you've got your other guy 50, 60 yards behind you that just and lights up. As soon up as the bull comes thinks, into view and can see where we're at, then we go quiet and the caller behind us takes over. And it makes that bull come another 50 or 60 yards. Smart. And so we did that. He just happened to <laughs> circle around us and get out on a ridge. And he was like 72 yards out through the burn. And Trent's like, no way I'm shooting at that. <laughs> and uh, he, well, he had shot, well, lost one the day before, shot it in the shoulder blade. Yeah. And, uh, or two days before. Day before. Day before. And so he was like, I'm not risking it. It has to be perfect. Yeah, yeah. And. Uh, 
keep going. No, okay. I was just gonna, yeah, so he was, wasn't going to take that shot. Bull circled around, and I think it was at 50 yards above him, and he went to come to full draw, and the bull saw the movement out in the burn. And didn't, you know, he just knew something wasn't right, and so he turned, didn't run, just turned and started walking away. And I said, just let him get to the ridge, and he got to the ridge, and I said, let's charge up. And so we charged up, and, you know, Dirk and I hunt that way, very aggressive. If the bull's not winded us, we push him. Yeah. And we got up on the ridge. He had disappeared over, and I said, I don't know where he went, if he dropped over this way, if he went that way. I don't know. Let's call and find out. And so Dirk called, and the bull answered, I don't know, 200, 250 yards up the hill or so. And uh, Dirk cut him off, and you could tell in the bull's demeanor immediately he just it was game on again. Mm. And so they dropped back 60 yards. We got to a little knoll where the bull had to come right to the edge of it, you know, within 20 yards of us yeah. to see where Dirk was at. Yeah. And, we, you know, Trent drew it 35 yards, 30 yards, whatever it was. The bull came into 12 or 15. I noticed, you know, me standing behind Trent in the burn, Trent at full draw, and Cody standing there with the camera. And he's like, something doesn't look right here. Yeah. And I'm sure it was their camouflage because they don't wear Sitka. <laughs> but, you know, it's, I'm, it's probably I the truth. Didn't see me. I hard, know that. A hard truth. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, uh, the bull knew, knew something wasn't right, and it was too late. Trent shot. And, and uh, you know, then it, it turned into a tracking job. Yeah. And frontal shots don't turn into tracking jobs. But I knew when he shot, the bull had whirled just slightly, and it looked like it impacted at just a slight angle. And we actually went over it in the Land of the Free series. You can you can mm-hmm. see that, um, just diagramming what happened and where you need to hit. But it got in. It got probably one lung. Uh, went in just at a little angle. Got inside the cavity, thankfully. But we tracked it for, I think it was two miles. Mile yeah. and a half, two miles. and So, so far. Yeah. And you mean, it's hard to find an animal when it's gone that far. I mean, it's really hard, and it's hard to keep your spirits up to keep going to track that animal that far. And, and, you know, Trent, there were six of us there, seven of us, or however many of us there were, and that makes a big difference. Yeah. Because Trent was, I mean, he's down. He lost a bull the day before, and now we can't find this one, and he's just, you know, down. Yeah. And we just all, you know, pitch in as a team. We're like, hey, keep your chin up. Oh, I found blood over here. You know, that lifts the, the spirits. But you go that first hundred yards it's like no big deal we aren't finding blood it's not a big deal they don't start bleeding until you know it's going to happen you shot him frontal there's going to be blood everywhere and then we get to 200 yards and it still just drops of blood and in my mind i'm immediately thinking he didn't get in the cavity he didn't hit the artery there he's not this is going to be a tough one yeah and you can see it in him by the time we get to 300 yards and the bull start turns and starts going straight uphill right and then it's like okay we have a we have a good chance of not finding this bull already and And you don't I mean, you don't know if it's a fatal hit or not. No. <clears throat> and there's just minimal blood. It looks like, you know, it's just chest muscle blood, and it's dripping, just drop, drop, drop. And within a half a mile, we're down to on our hands and knees looking for one drop of blood. And we did that for probably close to a mile. And Dang. we'd get on a trail and get tracked. But, okay, we know we're on him. These are his tracks. Here's a drop of blood to confirm we're still on it. But there were several times we spent 30 minutes spreading out with six people looking for that one drop of blood and of course you get six people spread out now you're stepping on tracks now you're knocking over a blade of grass that has the only drop of blood on it right and it just you know we had to be really careful unfortunately everyone there had a lot of elk hunting experience and tracking experience and so there was enough blood though that you were able to follow it for two miles yeah and and i'm talking a drop of blood every hundred yards enough blood uh, so it wasn't like, oh, yeah, we're able to stay on the trail and just bebop along following it. But we were able to find drops of blood and stick with it to confirm that we're still on the trail. It's a pretty special, I think it's a pretty special experience when you, when you, when you are able to, through that breadcrumb type trail, get to the end of it. Totally. It's, it's unreal. Yep. Um, and so unlikely. It, yeah, every, every step you take, it's... Less and less likely you're going to find it. I tracked a bear. My probably my greatest tracking achievement of all time, you know, tracking a bear uh, through Prince of Wales didn't really bleed at all, and I was tracking broken grass and twigs and yep. and you know and and getting all the way into practically right, and then we quit that night because it was dark and we we're just really down and talking to Chad about it. It was a bear he shot. 
Um, and we're just like really down and we're like, well, we'll just resume the track job in the morning. And so we go back in there and, and not, we were not 50 yards from the bear. Yep. So we found it like instantly. <laughs> um, but you know, man, it was, a, it was literally hands and knees. Uh, we had a little pair of shears and I was cutting like away the trail, like carefully inch by inch. I was just crawling through, um, Prince of Wales bush to find it. And, and uh, you think, you know, no blood, no nothing, whatever, yep. but um, then you find it, yep. you know, and it, but then there's times you don't. And that's how this one turned out. We got this bull literally climbed, gosh, I don't know, I'm making this up, but 1,200 feet in elevation. <clears throat> yeah. You know, it may have been more. It was all day basically hiking. We got up and it's three in the afternoon, something like that. And we're all sitting there very down. You know, I mean, the, the mood is somber. It's like, okay, this bull has got to the top, and he's dropped off the backside into the north-facing brush. We aren't going to be able to track him. We aren't going to be able to see blood. Chances are, are very minimal now. In fact, Dirk and Donnie took off hiking back to the truck to get the truck and drive around on the backside to pick us up when we drop out because we're basically, yeah. let's spread out, make a, a grid down through here, and then we're done. And we went... 100 yards from there and the bulls laying there dead and so i ran back up the top of the hill started screaming they were 400 yards down the hill and they came back up because we wanted everybody there yeah obviously to join in the reward holy and, cow yeah so it was you know what a moment just staying with it and not yeah. giving up and as long that's what you know all of us were talking about as long as we can find a single drop of blood we've got at least another couple hours of hiking and searching and if you can search for a couple hours and pick up another drop of blood that trail continues and it might only go 100 yards in that couple hours but yeah can't give up you need that you need people dedicated like that yeah all right Corey, uh, folks that are listening we had to take a small a short little break because we uh we got kicked to the curb (laughs) we had to find a new place to podcast displaced and had to move our couch back where nobody could see us that's right so now we've got a little private space back here by the sitka booth and total archery challenge yeah uh, so we're talking about, and now we're joined by Ryan Lampers also. Mm-hmm. And, but we were in the middle of that discussion about blood tracking. trail yeah. tracking and <clears throat> Ryan, um, on the land of the free project with Corey, when Trent shot his bull, not Trent, yeah. when, yeah, when Trent shot his bull, tracked it two miles and, uh, it was a painstaking tracking job. Almost to the point where most people probably wouldn't have found that bull. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, Corey, like, what, why do you think you found that bull? And what do you think are some common problems, like common issues that with, with guys in blood tracking where they don't recover an animal? You know, and that's one of the things that I, in, in the seminar I did a couple of years ago, I got into blood trailing as part of success. And it didn't make sense, you know, at first to a lot of people. I said, you know... There are so many people that shoot animals and don't find them. And if you found that animal, that's the difference between success and unsuccess. And so knowing how to track on shots that aren't always the greatest, and that, that happens when you're bow hunting. No matter how much we prepare, no matter how much we train, there are times and there are situations that come up where you don't make the perfect shot. And elk especially are tough animals. And even with a good shot, they can go several hundred yards or farther and depending on if you get, you know, quartering away shot and you've got back behind the rib cage where the fat seals up the hole and it hits the shoulder on the offside and you don't have any blood, yeah, that elk's going to die, but he might go 400 yards and not drop a, a single drop of blood along the way. So knowing how to track without blood, knowing how to read blood and knowing what kind of a hit you have, if you've got a gut shot, knowing to leave them for three or four hours before you bump them and then they run for a mile and you never find them because they don't bleed, just... All of those little things are so important, but I think at the end of the day, it's persistence. And like I mentioned, if we have a drop of blood, that prolongs our tracking for at least another two hours. And that might mean gritting for two hours without another drop of blood. But if I have a drop of blood, I don't say, you know, it's only a drop of blood, must not have hit him good, and then I quit right there. I've got two more hours of looking for one more drop of blood. You have a self-imposed rule then. I don't give up until I absolutely have exhausted everything I know that I can do and have not found any leads or any clues. I mean, it's, it's detective work at that point. 
mm-hmm. and you're looking for the needle in the haystack, one drop of blood to confirm that that track that you see, that scuff of dirt, or the pine needles being turned over, isn't from a squirrel. It's from the elk, and there's a drop of blood to confirm that. And this bull you found, <clears throat> it was it was dead. Yeah. It was dead. So it absolutely had died. And it didn't, did it die because it was pushed? Would it have survived? Or was this thing dead from the time the arrow struck? Just took some time. You know, it, I think what it did, the bull, uh, Trent shot at frontal, which I'm a, you know, I'm a educator of the frontal shot. Mm-hmm. I think it's a great shot. Trent made a great shot, but at the shot, the bull did whirl and it went in at an angle. So he got in the cavity. He didn't cut the, the arteries or anything. But he got probably one lung on the front, you know, offside there. And so that bull went two miles. It probably covered that distance in a matter of 15 minutes. And it died in its tracks there. So I'd say it was dead within 30 minutes max, right. probably 15 or 20 minutes. And it just took us that long. I don't, I don't remember how many hours we shot at it. 9.30 in the morning, found it at... 4 o'clock, 4.30, something like that. So seven hours of tracking, and it just took us that long to, to put the pieces together. We could hike that two miles in 30 minutes. Yeah. But looking for one drop of blood and going 100 yards for the next drop of blood, it took some time. <laughs> that's a, that's just doesn't seem <clears throat> like the odds are very much in your favor when you're on a trail like that. And they're not. And I think that's why people give up is... They want it to come easy, and they get a shot, and they get excited, and you're on that high, and then you go up there, and you track it for 100 yards, and realize there's no blood, and you drop to that immediate low, and unless you've got somebody there to pick pick you up, or you're mentally strong enough to be able to push through that, it's really easy to give up. So, Ryan, you, you hunt by yourself quite a bit. I do. What happens when you have a uh, tracking job like that, where it's, or has it, I mean, have you experienced that? Every shot has always been perfect for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Absolutely. Yeah, I know I've had I've had real tough tracking jobs where Corey's right. I mean, sometimes you you get you experience a low. You run out of blood. Um and like most likely what happened with that bull, it was a one longer. You know, sometimes they can go a long ways. And I what one thing that you hear out there a lot, and I I learned this you know my dad probably learned it from his dad and you've always heard a wounded animal doesn't go uphill (laughs) well if you've hunted long enough yeah you realize that's not the case especially with elk they can go uphill especially with one lung and they will and they'll get up there in a hurry so a lot of guys you know if they're they're starting that grid they'll kind of grid paralleled out and down and they'll never even look at the option of that bull going uphill and that, that can be a little dangerous. Um, I think we can kind of just like, you know, this whole land of the free, it exposed that that's not always the case. So that's something that I think people need to keep in mind is they mm-hmm. too, they can go uphill, especially on not a perfect shot. But I have had shots where in my head I played it over and over and over, and I thought it was perfect. Money behind the shoulder, heart shot, double lung. And then 300 yards into the tracking job, and I can't find that bull, and you'll run out of blood. I've had that happen in the past, but it is just due, due diligence. And, like, Corey's got a plan. You know, he, he stays for two hours no matter what after that last drop. Same with me. I mean, it's just relentless pursuit. And it, keeping your mind right during all that, but I think, you know, One thing about this Land of the Free project that's good for a lot of new hunters is seeing that. I'm kind of glad it happened because it shows that keeping on, keeping on it, staying with that bull, I mean, they were able to find that bull, whereas a lot of people would have walked away. And I think a lot of bulls get left in an instance like that. And people walk away from it and they don't do their due due diligence. Absolutely. And it's it's hands and knees sometimes. I mean, (laughs) turning stuff over, you know really working over over the ground and sometimes it's you know they'll go 30 40 yards without a drop and you have to you know kind of think ahead which way was that bull headed and which way would you take and typically not always but a lot of time they'll take that path of least resistance once they're hit yeah and you can kind of foresee where they probably want to went and um yeah grid it grid it that way but um no we're all gonna 
everybody, if you hunt long enough, you're going to have shots that aren't perfect. It's just going to happen, no matter how much you practice in the yard. But, um, yeah, just due diligence. Yeah. I think that, you know, what Ryan touched on there with the path of least resistance, understanding what a wounded animal is trying to do, you know, and, and understanding what routes it has to take. And uphill, they don't go uphill when they're injured, unless they want to go uphill when they're injured, yeah. you know, to get to someplace safe. And that's in Trent's bowl. He's out in a burn. It's hot. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. It's starting to get really warm in September. When they get shot, they their body's on fire. It's fever time. I mean, they're trying to get someplace cool. That's why you always hear them say they're going to the bottom, you know, where mm-hmm. there's water, or they're going to a water hole, or they're going to somewhere shady and thick. They want to get somewhere where they're going to be protected and where they're going to feel safe. And in this case, it was a mile to the top of the ridge, and there was nothing there. They were down feeding at night, and wherever he goes to, to bed during the day was where he was trying to get to. Once he got over the top of that ridge, he's on the north facing in the thick timber and the brush. He went 100 yards, and he was dead there. Right. But he had a desire to get to safety, and he went straight uphill for a mile to get there. Well, I think that's the one thing <clears throat> about, you know, animals. and You'll hear elk being touted as this tough, tough animal, and no doubt they are. But I think <clears throat> I've seen that, that heart in a lot of animals. Yep. Like, they don't want to die. Like, Absolutely. They want to survive they deal with trauma and injury and danger every day so for them getting shot that's just one more thing that they aren't thinking i'm gonna die they're thinking i've got to get somewhere to live and Mm -hmm. and i've seen them like do some amazing things all all animals it's not like they just roll over for you you know um what would you say is uh is like when you shoot an animal what are some of the things the first things that you do as soon as you've made the shot is like right away like mm-hmm. let the arrow go um well if i can replay it in my head i'm thinking about you know where i i really try to focus on where that shot went so i get a good idea of what you know how this is going to play out you know heart shot single lung double lung um <laughs> hopefully not anything too far back but immediately what i do is i always do go up and i look for my arrow um, I give it some time at that point, but I, I try to find that arrow. Obviously I want to see, you know, what's on it. Um, and, uh, I've been real fortunate over the years. I've never had a gut shot or anything like that. So that's been, you know, a blessing. I, I feel real fortunate. I've never had that happen. But, uh, at that point, you know, I kind of replay things in my head. If I know I got a hard shot, I'm going to give it some time and I'm going to, you know, go after it after that. But if I know I've got maybe not the absolute best shot, he whirled at the time I thought I was hitting him double lung. Um, maybe I got a single lung. I'm probably going to pursue that critter a little bit faster than I would, um, you know, if it was a, a perfect hard shot. <clears throat> single lung, I, I've i had good success kind of running them, pushing them a little bit more. Um, I don't know about you, Corey. No, and that's when you're saying that. It's, it's opposite, I think, of what we would – probably teach a newer hunter Mm -hmm. you know but i'm the same way if i get an arrow in him and i know that he's got a a potential of getting up and you know in an area where i can't track him i'm probably going to push him and try to get another arrow in him if for nothing else to get a good blood trail right and you know sometimes you just have to yeah i think it comes from experience but just knowing that okay he got shot if i bump him he can go forever if i don't get an arrow in him i won't be able to track him you have to back off Right. If it's you've the, got a, an arrow in him, you know he's going to die, and maybe it's quartering away, and you don't have, you know, you're not going to have good blood. I'll run after him and fling an arrow from you know 90 yards to get that blood trail to make sure mm-hmm. that I've got a follow up there, and I'll be a lot more uh, worried about just getting an arrow to draw some blood so I can track him if I need to. Um, one thing that I know you do, Ryan, and and I just you know you glazed over it there, but. At the shot, I think it's so important to see and to listen. You know, watch and listen to where the animal runs because that first 100 yards, sometimes there is no blood. Mm -hmm. And in certain terrain, you know, finding tracks can be tough. So knowing where he went and going down and picking up the blood trail there, there's been times that we don't see where they go and, you know, we're calling or whatever, don't hear it. And we go up there and trying to piece it together and even know where to start to start tracking it to find that blood trail is, is tough. So I think, you know, at the shot, like you said, visualizing, trying to see exactly where you hit seeing exactly where the animal's going and and i'm the same way i go up and pick up that arrow pretty quickly and confirm the hit and right. see what what there is right there for blood now Corey, if you were to make a real bad shot 
possibly not even got single lung. Um, what would you do? Are you talking behind the body yep. cavity, like yep. a little bit out back. of the thoracic opening? Yeah. Um, How much time, time are you going to get? Uh, it's a tough <laughs> one. I'm so impatient. Um, Late in the day. Yeah. Um, are you going to give them all night? It depends. It really does. And I was with Steve Chapel in Arizona several years ago, and Steve shot a bull right before dark, uh, hit it back. We knew it was back. The bull was at 20 yards or 25 yards, maybe 35 yards. And he shot and didn't stop it, and it just took that one step. He hit it in the paunch. We knew that. Next morning, we got on the trail, and we only went 250, 300 yards, and that bull stood up, <clears throat> still alive 12 hours later. <laughs> and we tracked that bull and stayed on his tracks and pushed him pretty hard, knowing that we didn't have a blood trail and had to keep on him. And he died at 2 o'clock that afternoon. So in those situations, we gave him 12 hours. Right. And he still had that energy to get up. Other situations, I've given a bull an hour and when you walk up there, he might still be alive, but he doesn't have the energy to go any farther. Whereas if you'd have bumped him. Shot him. Yep, exactly. Yeah, right. If you'd have bumped him after 15 minutes, he still had that energy. He could have went for miles. Right. So it's, it's really a, you know, a situational experience type of thing. And at the minimum, though, I'm thinking two hours yeah. if I know I'm back in there. I had that experience um, this year, and we talked about it, you know, that Montana hunt, where I did put a good shot on that bull, but... Uh, I think just kind of reiterating, if you go in too hot, too fast, even on a good shot, that bull went not very far, but that bear got on him so fast, even with that good shot, that bull was able to stand up, you know, out of his bed, fight off that bear a little bit, go bed down, get back up, which was shocking. I mean, it was a, it was a, you know, big pools of blood throughout that whole ordeal, but that was his will to survive simply because he had that adrenaline pushing through his veins and he did not want that bear to get on him. Totally. So, and that was a that was a good shot. That was a double lung shot, which shocked me, but it did reiterate the fact that you don't want to push him too early. Yep. That even, adrenaline even with a good shot. Yeah, when they get that adrenaline, they can just go. Yeah. And yep. yeah. Even with a good shot, like you say, let them sit bed down, whatever, give them at least thirty minutes and they start stiffening up. They start going yep. through that process of dying. And they don't have that strength. But if you bump them after 10 minutes, they've still got that strength and that adrenaline and can change the story fast. So what are you doing during your hour wait? It's so tough. <laughs> so to tough. A, uh, <clears throat> you hope you got service in that. In that yeah. <laughs> I, know I check I social media posts. Yeah, what, it's what, like, can I do? what can I do for, for an hour? No, we very rarely uh, do have any kind of reception or anything. And so no. it's, it's good to have, you know, you mentioned you hunt alone a lot. I hunt with a partner a lot, and that's... I end up looking at photos of my kids. Yeah. <laughs> it's like one thing that can pass the time that, uh, that keeps me going. So. Yeah. I, I noticed with uh, that Born, in the Ra- Born and Raised project this year that um, <clears throat> there were a couple of great examples of, of, of difficult recovery, Yeah, uh, including the one with BMAC in the Northwest where they were hunting on the coast or hunting Roosevelt and <clears throat> that's different country. Yep. Um, and it, they tracked that bull, B-Max bull a long way as well and had a hard time finding it. Yep. But S- found it but because found they it. stuck with it. Mm-hmm. So, and just in Wyoming, you know, there were several examples there. My bull, I shot it. It wasn't a great shot. It was back a little bit. I mean, still a lethal shot. Mm-hmm. But I just, I shoot until they fall over or out of sight. He whirled, and I cow called. I had another arrow on him. was at full draw and shot him at 30 yards. You know, as he was exiting the scene, he went another 30 yards and died. Uh, so getting that second shot was critical, or at least helped it speed up the process. Mm-hmm. Donnie's bull, 35 yards, came around a tree, and Donnie had his call in his pocket. Full draw, couldn't yeah. reach down and grab yeah. his call, so he shot. Well, at 35 yards, you can see the arrows going perfectly in line with the tree the bull's passing by. That's right where the vitals were when the bull, when Donnie shot. But just in that time, it went a good 36 inches. he shot inches. it on the walk. Yeah. Which totally surprised me when I was watching it. Like, yeah. Whoa. He didn't stop it. <laughs> didn't stop yeah. it. 35-yard shot, and he went from a perfect center punch shot to 36 inches back. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, he clipped that femoral artery, and the bull went 50 yards and was done oh, in that. a matter of 30 seconds. And yeah. Now, I can't remember on your bull, Corey, on that second shot, did you stop that one, or was that one of the boys behind you? 
that stopped that bull. I'm sure Why I he did. stopped in world. Yeah, I'm sure I stopped. I mean, yeah. Donnie was calling from behind. I was Cal calling. Yeah. That bull came in pretty hot, so he still, I don't think, knew what was going on after he'd been shot. Yeah. <clears throat> Since when does Donnie not have a call in his mouth? You know, I don't know. I gave Dirk such a hard time two years ago for the same thing, and uh, he missed that bull, and he had an opportunity in an open lane to stop it and didn't have a call in his mouth, and then ended up with some brush and hit the brush because you didn't stop it I think it I'm... <clears throat> I honestly think I'm physically impaired. Like, I can't actually draw my bow without a call in yeah. my mouth at the same time. I don't like, think there's ever a minute during daylight I don't have a call right, in my like mouth. Right, so. I have a hard time. Like, it's hard for me to picture not having one anymore. Yeah. I, re- I mean, I just use it or rely on it so much. Yeah. You know, so. Yep. No, calling, you've got to stop them. Shooting an animal, even at 20 yards on the move is... You know, it can be six to twelve inches off, just at twenty yards, just at a normal pace, without jumping yeah. or running or anything. I, so. I, another example was the Montana Wild. Um, Zach and Travis they they put their film together this year, the Outliers. Yeah. And um, or Outlier, I can't remember. But on that film, the the very last hunt that that that's on that DVD, or that that film, uh, they he. Sh- they shot one on the walk and again hit it too far back and it's uh, you know when when you cow call to a bull and you can shoot that arrow just seconds after that it seems like that perfect combination for for getting that shot where you need it and trying to shoot one like that on the walk where they can cover 3 feet yeah. in a second it just uh you just got to stop them yep <clears throat> Yeah, and I know, you know like Steve Chappell, he you know he doesn't use a call to stop him. And some people say you know a cow call is going to spook the elk. You know if they're in that close and they don't see another elk and they hear a cow call, they're like, I've got to get out of here. It's danger. And Steve just you know he does a map and catches their attention. They look, what was that sound? And I think anything that you can do to mm-hmm. to just catch their attention. That's what I do too. That's what making my, yeah, mouth I'm noise. Pretty sure I sound like a sheep when I'm yep. when I do it. It stops them, but yeah, I'll do the same thing. Yeah, I tried that voice. on a coos buck a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> How'd that work out? Did for not you? work out at all. <laughs> <laughs> Made him run faster. It actually didn't bother the buck, but the doe bolted like she had been struck by lightning, <laughs> um, and he was rutting hard after the doe. So as soon as that happened, she's gone. So that was kind of a, that was a bummer. Because uh, it was the closest I got to a coos buck that week, 40 <laughs> yards. And I don't know, maybe they would have stopped on their own, but they were just about to go down this disappear. Hmm. But uh, most of the time that works. I've, it rarely, on elk, it works, if I feel like, 100%. Yeah. I've never had it not work. Yeah. yeah. Especially when, that, that when they're in that zone, <laughs> they're in that 50-yard zone, and they are expecting something. They're looking for something. What I found has not worked at times, or what has really caused a problem, is when I've made a cow call as a bull's walking by and I need him to stop in a window. Yeah. And I go, meow. And I sound like the other 50 cows that are all right there as well, and he doesn't even hear it. And he's coming yeah. in looking for that bull that's been challenging him. Yeah. That cow sound doesn't make him stop in a window. It doesn't even phase him. And then he walks to another spot. But he did hear the cows, and now he's looking somewhat in that direction but it just doesn't bother him right so i pretty much if i when nowadays if i if i need a bull to stop i i always use a harsh call it's like yeah yeah and then they just stop look and then when i shoot the arrow it's like they might be amped a little bit or whatever but they seem to just the sound of the bow going off doesn't even make them flinch yeah it's like they've just like locked up you know Mm -hmm. and so I found that now now I don't get caught off guard like that. I remember a few times I was like, there's one bull came across, and he was very, very close from here to the camera. And I was at full draw, and <clears throat> there was all these cows. And so I was down like this, and a few of them stopped right at the camera and looked at me. And I was just like, come on, just keep walking, keep walking. And they were in single file, one after the other, after the other, after the other. And so close you could spit on them, you know. And then the bull came by about maybe eight, ten yards beyond that through the trees. And I'm like, okay, so I got the bow up and I started cow call, cow call, cow call, mew, 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 mew. Just like all the other cows that didn't even care, just would not stop. And then, you know, this was years, over ten years ago. 
and um, and I was like, oh, he's not stopping. And and then I took a shot while he's on the walk and hit him. I mean, again, it's really tough. They they move so fast. One step, one stride is is a lot. So you can lead that shot, but. I don't know how many of us practice leading shots with a <laughs> compound, but there's not a lot of instinct behind it. And yeah. Again, I learned that lesson hard, so I always call mm-hmm. pretty pretty intensely to get a to get an elk to stop. Yeah. Right. But back to the whole an animal being wounded, and then um, its behavior. I I remember <clears throat> watching uh, on this film uh, Trevor on the Land of the Free where he shoots that bull, and when I saw it, I was like, oh, that bull's dead. Like, behind the shoulder, in the pocket, it's dead. And I think they had to put, like, three, four more that arrows. That was that Idaho bull, right? I think was so. Idaho? It was wide open, wherever yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that didn't sound, I mean, it's not what I expected, you know? And so, you can think you hit him perfectly, mm-hmm. and you just, you don't know. Yep. So... You have to, I think, go into every tracking job, um, you know, with your best laid plans, your guess of what happened. But then you need to exercise discipline. There's one thing that I can't stand on, you know, and Aaron doesn't have a lot of patience, so this is a point of contention for us. (laughs) So I like to wait and give the animal some time because I figure he's going to die. So if I wait a little bit of time, especially if I think it's in the thoracic right. cavity and, and he's, you know, it's a good shot. I, but I don't want to jump him. I've had that happen many times. More times since I've hunted with Aaron than ever because Aaron starts tracking them the second they walk away. Right. I mean, like trying to hold him back is like trying to hold back an ocean wave. It's just <laughs> not. So he starts going right away. And, and, and he bumps them and they get up and they run and then... He's a good shot, so he can make those 120-yard shots, you know, and, and and stuff like that. But I, I just can't stand the whole bumping them, just leave them alone yeah. for a while. I think it's case by case. You know, I was hunting with Tyler Crockett this year, and uh, he shot a, a five-point at 25 yards. It ran down the hill 40 yards and fell over right there. Another bull's bugling up on the hill. And in Idaho, you can buy two tags. Tyler had two tags, and I said, hey. I'll try calling in this other bull. And he's like, well, I kind of want to hold out for a bigger one. He's like, yeah, let's call it in. So we called in, and it was a bigger one. And he shot it. His release wouldn't go off. He's at full draw. The bull comes by at 10 yards. And he's pulling on his release, and it won't go off. And it's trigger release. And he starts focusing on his release and not the bull. And finally it goes off, and he shoots it back. So he runs up on the cliff as the bull comes down below, and he shoots again and gets another arrow in it. And... I think he got one more shot and missed it. But we're down looking for arrows because we need more arrows. And that was one of those cases. It was raining. Um, he had two less than ideal shots as far as kill shots. You know, the bull was, was definitely sick and hit hard. And we got right on the tracks to try to get up on it and find it and get another arrow in it. And we did. And, you know, found it within 15 minutes, I think. Got another arrow in it. And it was dead right there. But... Yeah, I think it's just case by case. If it's just a clean gut shot, mm-hmm. you've got to give them time. And you yeah. know they're going to go 200 yards and bed down. And if you don't have any other blood trail or anything and conditions are good and you've got a couple hours, don't even take a chance. You know, give them time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the other part I was going to say is, um, <clears throat> besides giving them some time, is I don't like it when people charge ahead of the blood trail. Yeah drives me crazy yep and and so can you touch on that because <laughs> that takes ryan to doesn't hunt with others so he doesn't have to worry about a lot that. of discipline nope, or even me. yourself i mean because i will approach a blood trail i learned this from watching ben and anthony especially my cousin ben he's like a bloodhound you know just unreal and um so you know i see a drop and, and I, I pretty much, I did this in Texas quite a bit, too, with does that we shot from tree stands. And these things are, like, in the Matrix. They're, like, whoosh, like, sideways. They can dodge yeah. arrows like crazy. <clears throat> and so um, you don't hit them just where you want because they move. There's just no, right. n- it's unreal unless you see one in, 
and uh, watch it. And anyway, the doe, uh, we tracked a bunch. But, but getting on a piece of blood and, and then having a discipline to keep looking in the vicinity. You know, like, okay, this thing's bleeding. It's not a lot. But there is blood. I don't like moving from the point of blood that I have right here until I find the next point, like somewhere within this three to five foot radius, right? Especially if they're... And so how do you progress? Because you talked about this, Corey, where you go from, okay, here's my blood, and I'm track. okay, there's blood here, blood here. The, the, the space between the sign is about a foot, three feet, four feet, let's say. You know, so you can kind of stand where there's blood and you're, you're on your hands and knees, but you find more and you find more and you keep keep tracking. What I found with people is they, they lose, they're like, ah, and then they just go where they think the animal went. And they leave the trail behind. Yeah. And uh, um, I, I found that to be a very bad idea most of the time. Yeah. And there's a couple of reasons why. First off, you're getting off the path of where the elk is. And hoping to find something easy. And at that point in the blood trail, you're not going to usually find something easy. You know, it's going to be hard work to pick up a drop of blood. The second thing is if there's a couple people and all of a sudden you spread out and you start doing a little grid there, you know, looking for that easy stuff, you're stepping on that one blade of grass that has a drop of blood. You are kicking over the stick that has a drop of blood. You are... You're making scuffs that yeah, you, possibly could give exactly. you line of sight. That's one thing I've noticed is, uh, you know, not just keeping your focus right in front of you within that three feet circle. It's looking ahead. Yeah. You know, if you've got, you know, you're going through needles and you're, and you've got a good scuff mark along with blood, it's, you know, don't be afraid to look up and kind of see where that bowl went with through the scuff marks, not just the blood. But, um, yeah, definitely trying to not go up and disturb the crime scene if you will and get right. in there and cause your own you know disturbances and turning over leaves and pine needles and um, possibly turning over that drop of blood if you go too fast absolutely so do you guys mark the trail at all with tape or sticks or <clears throat> if, it, like- if it gets to the point where <clears throat> you know you're possibly going to lose your last drop you know for the most part i don't unless i am really stuck yeah um and you have to go back and just make sure especially if you got to leave it overnight obviously you're gonna you're gonna mark it and Try not to rely on your GPS, but uh, I I haven't marked it too many times. It's been a couple where and I, it's I really changed got now. Lost. They have GPS. You know, I think the flagging comes from back in the it does. 70s and 80s when that was yeah. all we had to find our way in and out. Mm-hmm. And yeah, but we do. I'll, I think I'll always, I was taught that as a kid. But yep, we got these fancy new <laughs> GPS. <laughs> mark now. it right here. You can walk right back yeah. to it. And yeah, it is handy though if you if you are just finding drops of blood. And it's 60 yards apart between the drops. If you put a, a piece of flagging ribbon at each of those, and then you get up the hillside 300 yards and look back and see, you can kind of get a line of sight. You know, that bull's traveling in a straight line. The next one's probably going to be up in here. And if you are on your hands and knees looking, it at least keeps you kind of in that yeah. first ideal path. Yeah, I find that uh, flagging tape is helpful on a blood trail. And um, <clears throat> I like to use it. When you get to the point where there's 50 yards, 60 yards, you know, like you were just saying, where we're no longer are you, uh, you have to leave the last blood pretty far behind yeah. to find the next blood. That's, I think, when a lot of people quit. So what do you do? What's your strategy at that point? You kind of touched on it earlier about, like, gritting. Yeah. Like, how- I'll always, always come back to that last drop of blood and pick a path. And we got really good in or got really lucky in Wyoming, there was dead grass. And it was 12 inches high or so. And I got to the point where I was getting down and looking, and you could see grass that had been stepped on and knocked over and see a little bit of a path through it. And we would just, you know, get down and look at that, follow that, follow that, follow that, looking at every little head of grass, trying to see if there's a drop of blood, if something rubbed off on it. And I would say six or eight drops of blood that we found over 400 yards were just that simply following that path without blood and confirming that it was that elk with a drop of blood and yeah when you go big distances between blood drops i mean that may be your only clue yeah. the only thing you have to go on is is some blades of grass knocked down or trying to figure out those scuff marks as to where they went yeah that may be the only thing you have so it's pretty important not to go in disturb it yourself and Definitely look ahead and try to figure out ahead of time before you're just, you know, head down, eyeballing in front of you, look ahead and see where that bull is taken. 
And I think, you know, I think Aaron is the one that said it a while back that um, bad shots are really good trackers or something yeah. like that. You know, he's, you know, good trackers come from being bad shots or, yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah. And for me, you know, I just, I grew up around it. Um, archery, you just, you, you're in situations where there are less than ideal shots. And I think what really drove it home to me was I lost an elk one year and thought I made a good shot. It was quartering away. It was 35, 40 yards. Everything was good. And I had no blood, which is part of the reason I don't like quartering away shots anymore. I like broadside or frontal and, you know, I'll, I'll pass up a quartering away shot at 40 yards just knowing that I may not have a blood trail at all. Right. And you're only catching one lung usually on a you know, steep quarter. So right. anyway, I shot this bull, thought I made a good shot, got on the track and realized that there wasn't any blood. So we gave it a couple hours, got on the track again, and same kind of thing. You know, you always think once they get in a straight line, he's gone a half mile in a straight line, he's going somewhere. And we started gritting and gritted until dark and up and down the hill everywhere and came back the next morning and 20 yards from where we had last blood, he had circled back into the thick alders and was laying there dead. And mm. I lost that elk, put my tag on it, and that was the first elk that I had shot and, and lost. Mm. And it just drove home the point that you've got to figure this tracking out because yeah. that bull was within 20 yards of the last blood we had. We spent three hours after that last blood mm. gritting all the common sense areas and not coming back to that last point of blood and going every different direction from there looking for it. And my worst experience, well, I've had a few where I haven't found an animal that I've shot, but blacktail has been the hardest for me. And my biggest blacktail buck I never did find. And um, that was uh, that was just really frustrating because he, he died. I never saw him again on game camera. seen him every year up to that point. Um, and, uh, it just, he didn't bleed like, like, uh, he should have. And I'm sure he was somewhere nearby. Um, a couple years before that, I had shot another blacktail buck and I didn't find, find that buck either. But like you, I was within 20 yards of him, um, and never, never found him until two, three months later when all the blackberries had died away and the whole undergrowth had disappeared and it's, it's pretty open under a canopy of trees at that point and it was like there he is right there hmm. and uh i had searched all over and he had burrowed himself into the center of this is august into the center of a pile of blackberry bushes and i had searched everything around and couldn't find it and i just didn't realize he had gone into the heart of it you yeah. know and then when those blackberries died off, there's his bones and everything there. And it was sad. Yeah. But on that particular buck, <clears throat> the biggest mistake I made is he had, I, I shot him and he had ran and bedded and laid down. And, and then I spotted him from quite a distance off. And, um, and had I just left him there, he would have just died. But instead... I, I pushed him, yeah, and uh, he got up, and then, like blacktails do, you know, kind of outwitted me. Did some. He's looking over his shoulder, and he's there to outsmart me. He didn't go very far. <laughs> he just uh, gave me the slip. Yep. And and I don't think in their minds they realize they're dying. They're looking for a place to hide. They know that they aren't feeling well, and so he finds the thickest, nastiest place he can and climbs in there to hide. And the place where he was. He felt safe until yep. I pressured him. Right. Yep. So um, I just was so excited. And I was like, I can get another arrow and I can do another arrow. When the first arrow was good enough, yep. it just was going to take, take a little time. Right. So I, I should have just been more patient and, and waited. But it was, it was, again, I was pretty new to archery and I was just so excited. Yeah. So. No, and I just think it's, you know, like you say, it's case by case. In that case, you should have gave it more time other times it's like i need to get another arrow in that animal immediately and i think that comes from experience and that's with the online course there's a whole module that i talk about tracking and following the blood trail yeah and one of the most important parts i think is understanding the anatomy of the animal and knowing where to aim where to hit but then when you don't hit there what you actually did hit and how that animal is going to be affected Absolutely. by it Absolutely. yep well, we got into this discussion but we, uh, from talking about your season, you know, kind of got on this tangent on the blood <laughs> blood tracking and stuff. I think it's important. But um, you were telling me a little more about your season. 
and I, I to take us back to uh, this um, hunt of a lifetime. Yeah. So we we left Wyoming, uh, shot the four elk there, and came back to Idaho. Uh, Donnie passed up an elk in Idaho, and then shot uh, his bull. I'm trying to think the order here. No, I shot my bull first. So I shot my bull, then Donnie shot his, and we're sitting there with four or five days, nothing to do. So we hunted with Tyler Crockett. He shot those two elk that you know we mentioned just a few minutes ago. Yeah. And that led us to the last hunt of our, you know, the elk hunt of the fall, which was one we were really looking forward to, which was the hunt of a lifetime hunt. And every year we've been blessed to take out a child with a life-threatening illness. And this year the, the young man was 14, came from Pennsylvania. Yeah. And had a brain tumor, brain cancer. And going into that, you know, we that's the experience. I want to be able to help somebody like that that's just struggling. I just want to be able to provide a bright spot that I know elk hunting can be. Yeah. And it was just amazing to me. You've got a 14-year-old kid from Pennsylvania, gone through all this. He spent year, you know, the last couple of years in hospitals, and he doesn't want to go to Disneyland. He wants to go on an elk hunt. And... For me, that's something we take for granted. You know, that's something that just, it's so easy for us because we grew up in it. I have elk in my front yard, you know, and for him, that was his dream, knowing he might not live, you know, knowing he's fighting a life-threatening illness, and that's the one thing he wants to accomplish. And so I think it inspires us to to give it our all and to make yeah. sure we're on point and, and ready for it and not taking it <clears> for granted. <throat> and so he showed up, just great little, I mean, just young man <laughs> battling a lot but just has a, a warrior's heart and we met him and and obviously you know he's, he's been through a lot physically he wasn't able to get after it and go like you need to for elk sometime and we spent uh, some of the time carrying him on our backs you know piggybacking him up the hills and he was struggling to to physically go where we needed to go and so we found some elk way up ahead of this canyon and I knew I couldn't mentally convince him to walk up all the way where they were. So I said, hey, those elk are going to be just around this first ridge. Once we get up there, we should be able to hear them, and we'll, we'll be in position. And so we took off up the trail and couldn't hear the elk at that first ridge. And really? so I stayed 30 yards in front of him. And we have a great group. There were six or seven of us there, you know, people back carrying his stuff, walking with him, encouraging him. Some of us up ahead, you know, trying to locate the elk. And I made sure I stayed far enough ahead of him that he couldn't complain. And wasn't going to say, I can't go any farther. Mm-hmm. And we finally got to a point where we stopped. And he said, I thought you said that we were going to find them back on that last ridge. And I said, I can hear him bugling. They're just another half mile up the trail. Can you go? And he said, I can't go any farther. And so we got off the trail right there and set up. And I said, well, we'll try to call them down here. And we're in an area where there's a lot of bulls. It's first week of October. They are focused 100% on breeding. Calling an elk in is, is difficult. Hearing him bugle getting in close to him with calls and everything, but actually pulling a herd bull away from a herd is is tough that time of year. Mm -hmm. And we got up and started calling, and bulls were bugling. There were probably 10 or 12 bulls up on the hillside within three-quarters of a mile of us bugling, but nothing close. And the biggest sounding one was clear at the head of the drainage, and he started working his way towards us. And I thought, he's just pushing cows. They're coming down to bed in the dark timber, which we have to get them out in the open. Mm -hmm. And... Next thing I know, he's bugling in the creek bottom and coming up our way. I thought, you've got to be kidding me. This big sounding bull is going to land in our laps. Yeah. And he stepped out. I was 40 yards up the hill from him calling. And this bull stepped out of the creek bottom, hit the trail, and turned and walked up six yards from where they were set up with the rifle. And Austin was having troubles uh, with his vision just from the the brain surgery and the tumors and stuff. He couldn't see really well, and he couldn't find the elk in the scope. And he's looking, even when it first came out at 40 yards, he couldn't see it. Yeah, you were telling me that, you know, his eyes aren't quite where they need to be. Yeah, vision's just not not good. And looking through a scope, it's tough for anybody, but when you can't see and looking through a scope I wanted to. I wanted to kill a couple of youth this year. Uh, <laughs> target acquisition is not a, uh, a youth strength. Yeah. And, I mean, we Caitlin could have killed so many elk if she could just find the darn in the elk scope. in the scope. Yep. Same with Dwayne's kids, both both his kids. Uh, it You need time. Yep. You need time. And at six yards with an elk standing there, you don't have time. It's It's got to happen. 
And Donnie, Donnie was sitting right with him. He was right there telling him, okay, you got to get ready, put the bullet in, take it off safety, you know, everything to do. And Donnie reached over and grabbed the stock of the rifle and just pulled it over like that and said, pull the trigger. And Austin said, do what? And he said, just pull the trigger. <laughs> and so without looking through the scope completely, Donnie pointed the gun and they pulled the trigger. And <laughs> What a story, wow. dude. It, it gets better. So oh. here's, here's Austin. He's really quiet. He doesn't talk very much at all. Um, carrying on conversation, you know, he's just, he's deeply yeah. thought a lot, I think. Yeah. And it was really hard to pull him out of his shell and to, to, you know, get him to be a 14-year-old kid. Mm-hmm. And as he walked up on the elk, he got excited, and it was really awesome. You know, you walk, it's a 7 by 8 bowl. If you haven't watched the film, it's, you got to watch it just for that call in. <laughs> Beautiful bowl. But uh, he walked up, and he's counting all the points. He said, how big is it, Austin? He said, it's a 15-pointer. <laughs> and so we're all laughing nice. and high-fiving. And his dad said, uh, Austin, how would you feel about saying a prayer? And when I was 14, a bunch of adults, somebody asked me to pray. I think I'd have probably said, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I'll do that. So we all held hands, got in a circle around the elk, and he started praying, and he started sobbing. And... He's just saying, you know, Heavenly Father, thank you for these men that you've placed in my life. Please bless them with strength that they'll be able to continue doing what they're doing for people who are sick like me. And, I mean, we were all just sobbing there on the mountain. (laughs) And uh, it it just drove home that point that we take it for granted. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got back home and went in and they did a scan and found that he had another brain tumor and had a biopsy last week and still still fighting it. (laughs) And it's... uh, just, I'll never forget those experiences. What we what we were able to do wasn't for him; it was for us. And what he did mm-hmm. for us uh, just makes elk hunting and everything we do so much more rewarding. What do you think made that bull come in? <laughs> uh, that's our <laughs> third year of being involved, and I have no doubt there's divine intervention <laughs> that that bull was placed. Where it was, when it was, for who it was placed there for. And that's that's it, the first thing I thought of when I first saw that bull. No. It, was, it just wow. seems to keep happening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Last yeah. year, you know, the bull that we called in, we called it in four times. And it's a 350-inch bull. Mm-hmm. They don't do that very In October. Often. <laughs> called it in three times, and the fourth time it came in and stood there for a minute and a half while this 8-year-old boy from Pennsylvania again was trying to find it in the scope. A yeah. bull like that. With seven people sitting right there talking and yeah, moving that was and the lifting. Part too. Yeah, <laughs> it stood there. It bugled back at us. It, that doesn't happen naturally. No, it doesn't. No, it was meant to be. For sure. it, yeah, I can't seem to shoot him up an alfalfa field in Montana. So, I mean, <laughs> uh, what a cool story, man. Yeah, yeah no, that was, the, that was the highlight of the season. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast. We, uh, we got another show to do later today with uh, you two guys, and um, so folks can look forward to that episode. And so with that, you got anything you want to add at the end here? Stay gritty. I like it. <laughs> Bye, guys. Despite our ever-changing, ever-indignant world with its growing ignorance of and indifference to the ways of the wild, I remain a predator pitying those who revel in artificiality and synthetic success while regarding me and my kind as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood. I stalk a real world of dark wood and tall grass stirred by a restless wind blowing across sunlit water and beneath star-strewn sky. And on those occasions when I choose to kill, to claim some small part of nature's bounty for my own, I do so by choice, quickly, with the learned efficiency of a skilled hunter. Further, in my heart and mind, I know the truth and make no apologies for my actions or my place in time. Others around me may opt to eat only plants, nuts, and fruits. Still others may employ faceless strangers to procure their meats, their leather, their feathers, and all those niceties and necessities of life. Such is their right, of course, and I wish them well. All I ask in return is no one begrudge me, and all of us who may answer the primordial stirrings within our hunter's souls, my right to do some of these things myself. What you just heard is a quote from M.R. James. 
We truly live in a world that is largely ignorant and indifferent to the ways of the wild. And although some regard us as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood, we have the opportunity to change the way these people view the hunter and the hunt. We can share our experiences and nature's bounty with those who employ these faceless strangers. And by so doing, we make a difference, not just for ourselves, but for the wild animals in the wild places we care so deeply about. Never stop sharing your passion for hunting and the outdoors. Our wild animals and our wild places depend on it. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman. 